Good morning, everyone. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Welcome to South Abbotsford Church, where we're on a mission to follow Jesus, making him known in all we do. We're glad that you've chosen to join us this morning, either here in person or on live stream. We hope you're going to be encouraged through the songs of worship and the message from God's word. If you're new to South Abbotsford this morning, it's important for us to get to know you. You'll find a Connect card on the, uh, uh, if you go to the main page of our uh, webpage, there's a button there for the Connect card, southabbotsford.com. Feel free to let us know who you are and how we could help you connect 
with our church ministry programs or to pray for you. Well, it, it does look like, and I'm assuming it also feels like there's a little more room in the pews this morning. Well, it's, uh, there's 130 of our youth and youth leaders on a retreat at Timberline Ranch this morning. And we're just uh, grateful that they've had this opportunity to gather. They had their proper protocols in place to, to pull this off, and they were just excited uh, to get away. So I'd, I'd like us to take a moment uh, just to pause, to quiet our hearts, and to pray for them this morning as they also gather uh, for their final worship service this morning together in a message from Pastor Mike. Would you join me in prayer? Father, we acknowledge you as our Lord and Savior, and we thank you for the young people that identify with and call South Abbotsford Church their church, where they're participating uh, in our youth ministry programs, that they come under the teaching and leadership of Pastor Mike and the team. And God, we know that it's challenging times for young people to, to follow Jesus. And so we're grateful that, that they've committed themselves to be a part of this retreat this weekend. And we just pray for your spirit to, to be powerfully present. And even as they gather this morning in their final session, that, that you would just speak to their hearts, draw them into a personal, loving, and deepening relationship with your Son and our Lord Jesus Christ. We commit them to you in Christ's name. Amen. Well, we're one week away from Halloween, and it's become a South Abbotsford tradition to host Halloween hotspots. Listen carefully. There's an update that's been prepared for us this morning. Good morning. Uh, welcome to our Halloween hotspot update for October 24th. Um, we're glad to report that things are trending um, in the right direction. Um, up. Um, so Halloween hotspots are a go, and we are happy to report that to date, our local stores have procured uh, roughly 1,976,243 pieces of Halloween candy, um, 192,426 tins of hot chocolate and less than a vast supply of <coughs> pop-up tents with a surge capacity of 42 at uh, our local Walmart. Um, we've worked closely, uh, mostly with ourselves, <laughs> to develop what we're calling a commune with ease plan um, to help make your hotspot the best it can be. So at this time, I would uh, it's my honor to, to turn this briefing over to Dr. Henry Bonney. Thank you and good morning. So I have the Halloween hotspot update for today, October the 24th. We have 83 new hotspots to report. Of those 83, 21 are in Vancouver Coastal, 46 in Fraser Health, 3 on the island, 4 in the Interior Health Region, and 9 in the Northern Health Authority. I would like to take this time to say that I've been very heartened at the outpouring of support for our Commune with Ease plan, particularly uh, with those closest to us that are longing for these deep social connections at this Halloween time. Our children, our grandchildren, our parents, grandparents, elders, those closest to us. And remember to be kind, to be calm, and to Halloween hotspot on. Thank you. All right then. If you actually want more information or suggestions about how you can host a Halloween hotspot, go to our website, southabbotsford.com forward slash hotspots. It's great to have creative people among us. Well, we invited you to participate in a special Thanksgiving offering that was going to support our ministries locally and globally, and also to help cover the costs of our exterior care capital project. 
The Thanksgiving offering was just over $21,000, and that, of course, was to be shared. So we've now just raised just shy of $90,000 towards our goal of $140,000 for the Exterior Care Project. And we're grateful we're well on the way uh, to meeting that project's needs. A special thanks to everyone who participated in this offering. Giving options as we continue to support the ministry here at South Abbotsford are listed on our website. There's a giving box here at the front. Uh, there is a debit credit kiosk in the foyer. May God bless you as you support the work of the Lord locally and globally through South Abbotsford. Well, this morning now in preparation to hear a word of the Lord through Pastor Matt, I invite you to join your voices in praise to our Lord and Savior as Meredith and the worship team lead us. I invite you to stand with us if you're able. Welcome here.
Good morning, church. My name is Meredith. I'm the worship arts and young adults intern here. And we're so glad you're here this morning. And so Michael mentioned that we had the youth retreat this weekend. I was just there for the last two days and I came back early to be here. But I'm coming feeling so encouraged by the way we were able to see God meeting youth and youth leaders in their places of need wherever they were at. And I'm a firm believer that he's already doing that for us this morning together. And I invite you to continue to respond to Jesus in worship as he meets us wherever we're at this morning. So let's continue to worship.
We're going to invite our kiddos to come up here at this time. If you want to make your way to the front and find your leaders up here. Let's just, let's cover them in prayer as they make their way up to the front. Lord, thank you for each one of these children. Um, thank you. They all bear your image, and I pray that they would, they would hear your voice this morning. We thank you that you're with them and guide their leaders as they teach them. And Lord, we, we praise you for all that you're doing in our kids' hearts in this church this morning. Amen. So feel free to make your way out and head to your rooms. So, last week we introduced a new song called Highlands, and as Jay mentioned last week, that it's um, it's a fairly poetic song. The lyrics are pretty poetic, and so I invite you to stand with us as we sing it once more this morning, and feel free to sing along if you know it already but also feel free to just listen and look at the lyrics and think about what they mean. all 
the same. No less God within the shadows. No less faithful when the night leads me astray. You're the heaven where my heart is. In the highlands and the heartache all the same. Thank you for the assurance that we have that um, you're with us in every place, in every space, in every praise, in every sorrow. You're there, no less different. Uh, You're not more with us in one than the other. You are always fully present in our lives. And, and we thank you for that, God. God, I know that, that in this moment, even there are some in, in this room here who really need an experience of that nearness. They're walking through stuff. They're finding themselves in the valley. And God, they, they just need that thickness of your presence. They need to hear your voice again. Just say that you love them. God, I pray that you just... Give that gift even in this moment. God, thank you that you are here and that you have inhabited our praises. We don't sing to an empty room. We sing to a living God who's right here. And God, thank you that you're here to speak to us, to share truth with us, to give purpose to our lives. And so, God, might we hear something of that even in these next few moments together. I ask all these things in Jesus' powerful name. Amen. Thanks. You can be seated. Well, hey, before I jump into uh, uh, what I want to talk about today, I want to just give you a little heads up about the next few weeks and where we're, where we're going to be going. Uh, I think it goes without saying that one of the significant conversations going on in our culture today 
is around gender and sexuality. And it's not a conversation that we can or should sidestep as a faith community. So we're going to be talking about sexuality, gender, and faith for the next three weeks here in our morning services. Now, as part of that series, we're also going to have uh, sort of like a, a town hall evening, uh, a chance for us to just come together and have some conversation around tables and wrestle with the things that we, as a church community, need to think about in order to engage uh, not just engage a conversation, but more than that, we need to wrestle with how we engage the people who are represented by the congregation, because they are real people. It's not just an issue, it's people. And uh, we need to figure out how to do that in a way that embodies a Christ-like posture. And so that town hall, just giving you a heads up, that's going to take place Sunday night, November 7th at 7 o'clock over in the gymnasium. So just, if you want to mark that on your calendar, we'll remind you over the next couple weeks, but uh, just wanted to give you a heads up and would love for you to be a part of that evening. All right. Today we're going to uh, focus our time together on the last of the four shifts that as a church we, I think, need to seriously wrestle with if we're going to be on mission together, making Jesus known in the city of Abbotsford. So to this point, if you recall, we talked about a shift from you know, focusing on attendance to focusing on transformation, uh, shifting from a, a collection mindset to a mobilization mindset, moving from competition to collaboration with other people who follow Jesus. And, and now today I want to think with you for a few moments about the shift from addition to multiplication. Now, uh, I am, I'm not the brightest kid on the block, as many of you already know, uh, so sometimes it takes me a little bit longer to clue into things than the average person. Uh, so for the, the past few months, as I've been meeting with Pastor Cam and Pastor Norm and Pastor Brian from these other three churches that we've been you know, talking about collaboration, and we've, we've talking about these four shifts that we've all been preaching on this fall, you know, I admit that, that the other three shifts, pretty quickly, like I, I knew what we were talking about. I, I, I understood them. They, they, you know, they, they made sense to me. But this shift, this shift from addition to multiplication, uh, took a little bit longer to click for me. Now, don't get me wrong. I know enough about math to know what addition is and what multiplication is and how they're different. I know that. But I was sort of struggling to figure out, well, like, like, what does that mean in the context of a church reaching its city with the good news of Jesus? To me, as I thought about, well, is, isn't, if we do that by multiplication, isn't that just sort of like doing it by addition, but with bigger numbers at the end of the equation? But I think I'm starting to get it now. And, and maybe what's most embarrassing uh, about, about it is that, you know, it took me this long to figure out and all the while, we are all living through the best metaphor we could use for the difference between growth by addition and growth by multiplication. Uh, the COVID pandemic is the perfect example of how the multiplicative effect works. Did Cam use that word last week, multiplicative? It's his favorite word, so I'm sure he must have. Using COVID as an example, like what would growth by addition look like? And here's what I think it would look like. It would be like starting with, like, like let's say we started with a pool of a thousand people all infected with COVID, but they're the only ones who can transmit the disease. So would other people get COVID? Absolutely. But it would, it would be one here and it would be two there. It would be slow to transmit. Uh, it would be simple to con contain because a relatively few in, a number of people can actually spread it. Frankly, it would not result in a pandemic, not even close. It's the version of COVID I wish we had had. But that's not the story, is it? No, how COVID has gone is actually quite different. It's gone more like this, where all you need is one person, one individual at the start who has the disease, and they spread it to a few people. And then all those people turn around and spread it to a few more people, and all those people turn around and spread it to a few more people, and before you can blink, life as we know it is radically altered because we have this virus that has spread like wildfire. The first person might only spread it to a few people, but because so many people become transmitters, 
It ends up all over the world. So transpose that now to Christianity. See, addition is what happens when you have like a few career missionaries. Uh, you, you have, you know, a few professional church leaders. And then you have, you know, those few people in your church too who are like super evangelists, right? And, 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 and they're out there winning this person and that person and two there and three there. And, you know, it's, it's, it's growth by addition. Multiplication is different. See, multiplication is what happens when every Christian understands their calling to be a transmitter, if you will. Every Christian sees themselves as a missionary. And, 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 and where that army of missionaries isn't sim- simply content to win converts, but to make disciples of Jesus. Because when you make a disciple... See, I I think by definition, actually, a disciple is someone who can turn around and make another disciple. And then those disciples turn around and make other disciples of their own, and on and on and on it goes. Back in uh, 1997, a guy named Roddy Stark wrote a book entitled The Rise of Christianity. And the tagline for the book on the cover was this. How the obscure, marginal, Jesus movement became the dominant religious force in the Western world in a few centuries. How the obscure marginal Jesus movement became the dominant religious force in the Western world in a few centuries. It's, it's really a great summary of what actually happening and it happened. And it really, it was astonishing if you think about it. Right? In the Gospels, we read about Jesus... And and his movement beginning with 12 men and an unknown number of women who are traveling around the countryside with him. Then we come to the book of Acts, where the the church is born, if you will, and around the year 30. And Acts tells us about, you know, a group of 120 Christians right near the beginning. According to Rodney Stark, by 100 AD, that group of 120 had multiplied to an estimated 25,000 Christians. And by 310 AD, 210 years later, that group of 25,000 Christians had grown to an estimated 20 million Christians. Folks, that kind of growth doesn't happen just by addition. That doesn't happen by the early church, you know, growing at the pace that churches in the Western world are growing today. No, that kind of growth can only happen in a movement of multiplication. And in fact, as we turn turn to the Bible, I think we actually see hints that that that's exactly the strategy that the early church had. They weren't thinking of, you know, hey, we we just got to train a few professionals and and some super evangelists to, to win the odd person here and there for Christ. No, they were an intentional movement of multiplication. They were thinking about making disciples who make disciples who make disciples who make disciples. A second Timothy is one place we can go to. has, I think, a great example, a couple great examples, actually, of this kind of generational movement of Christianity, that they're thinking this way. Uh, in the first chapter, in Paul's introduction in the letter, he, he says this. He says, I thank God, who I serve, as my ancestors did, with a clear conscience, as night and day I constantly remember you in my prayers, recalling your tears. I long to see you so that I may be, re- be-, be filled with joy. I am reminded of your sincere faith, with, which first lived in your grandmother Lois, and then in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded now lives in you also. Right, so here, here we have this picture, the first picture, of the gospel moving through the generations of a family. One generation discipling the next generation, who disciples the next generation. And incidentally, I think as parents, I think this is a great reminder to us that our our role in our kids' life isn't just to parent them. We are disciple makers. Our homes are a mission field. And just just as a quick aside on, on that point, 
I just want to say this. You know, I, I think sometimes we have this assumption that, that hey, you know, if we're, if we're good Christian parents, we'll automatically be able to disciple our kids towards walking with Jesus, and it's just going to be this painless process. It'll just kind of happen. And if you've had that experience, then great. Lots of good Christian parents don't have that experience. And, and I just want to say, if that's where you find yourself at today, I just want to affirm <laughs> that what you're engaged in in your home really is the work of disciple making. You are already in the thick of it. And it can be just as challenging as any other kind of disciple making you might engage in outside the home, if not more challenging actually sometimes. And your need for the Holy Spirit to be at work for anything of lasting value to happen is very real. Uh, You know, the the best missionaries could tell you that when it comes to the process of discipleship, You can be faithful in trying to disciple somebody and there's just still no guaranteed results. So just just like like if you're a parent here today and some of what I said just, you know, is some of your experience, I just want, just just know that disciple making in your home being really challenging doesn't mean you're doing anything wrong. It's a more common experience than you might think and just don't let the enemy speak lies to you about your sense of failure. There are no guarantees. Just keep being faithful. Keep being faithful and know that you're not alone in that experience. Okay, back on track. Here we have this picture in Timothy of what discipleship looks like as it happens through three generations of a family. And then look what Paul says in the next chapter. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard me say in the presence of many witnesses... Entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Once again, we have this picture of the gospel moving through generations, but this time it's not biological generations, it's like like faith generations, right? Paul is a disciple of Jesus who has discipled this guy named Timothy. And Timothy is then supposed to turn around and disciple other people, and then those people are supposed to turn around and disciple other people generations of Jesus followers. Paul, Timothy, those Timothy disciples, and then a whole nother generation after that. And Paul himself only disciples one person in that picture. And yet there are numerous more disciples that are developed because of the effect of multiplication. Multiplication isn't about how many new converts a few specifically skilled and trained people can win. It's about how we all grow into being disciples who can invest in another generation of disciples, who can invest in another generation of disciples. You know, right now, this, this picture I've given you, this is how the gospel is moving so rapidly in the global south. Uh, It's precisely through these kinds of disciple-making movements. And it's not a bunch of professional missionaries or church planters who are making it happen. I mean, they might be somewhere in the multiplication chain, but by and large, you read the stories, you listen to what God's up to, it's ordinary people reaching other ordinary people, generation after generation after generation. Jerry Trousdale was involved in disciple-making movements amongst the Muslim people in Africa. And he tells the story of, of taking a group of Christian leaders to a particular country in Africa so that they could see firsthand what this kind of multiplying disciple-making movement looks like, like on the ground. How does it really look? And, and, and as he was, as, as he and the group, they landed at the airport and getting off the plane and, and he's talking to them about how prolific the disciple-making movement was in that region, and he said to them as, they're, as they're, they're slowly walking into the airport that they might not even get out of the airport without running into someone connected with one of these disciple-making movements. And it just so happened that, there, that while he was talking to the group, nearby there was an immigration officer who was handling one of the customs lines, and, and this man overheard what Jerry was talking about. And with a big smile on his face, the officer turned and said to Jerry and said to the group, said, I work here at the airport, but I'm a disciple maker, and I've just planted my first church. 
not only did they not get out of the airport without running into someone involved in this disciple-making movement, they couldn't even clear customs before it happened. And it was a border agent who actually saw his identity as being a disciple-maker. Isn't that awesome? And here's the thing, that's not a one-off. That's not like the, you know, the exception to the rule kind of story. In countries where disciple-making movements are really taking hold and really taking off, everyone seems to see themselves as disciple-makers and church planters. Uh, Jerry Charles Dell says the, the single most powerful response that Christian leaders f- from, from North America and Western Europe have when they visit a country where one of these disciple-making movements taking hold is to say exactly that. They say, everyone here is making disciples. The accountants, the custodians, the police, the doctors, the farmers, they all see themselves as disciple makers. These are not movements driven by professionals or highly qualified people by our usual standards. It's ordinary people. And and really, that shouldn't surprise us, should it? I mean, I know it's been said a million times, but but I'm not sure we ever let it sink in quite deep enough that the Bible is full, and I mean full, of stories of God choosing the least likely candidates to carry out his purposes, to move his story forward. Consistently through Scripture, it is not the person who, culturally speaking, is the prominent figure in any given story who's the person that God ends up working through. And of course, Jesus and his, his choice of disciples is a great example of this. The, the, the people who got the Jesus movement started were, were ordinary people. They were underqualified for the job. Not, actually, not underqualified. Some of them were disqualified, frankly. Right? It's James and John who, you know, instead of being like locked in on the mission Jesus has given, given them, they get sidetracked trying to figure out how following Jesus could work to their personal advantage. They're angling for the best seats in the house when Jesus would ascend to his throne. How about Peter, right? Peter, the rock, who is anything but rock-like. More like rock-headed when he takes Jesus aside and tries to lecture Jesus about talking about his impending death. Imagine that. More like rocky soil, you know, the kind that Jesus taught about. When in the face of potential danger after Jesus' arrest, Peter just withers into the background and walks away. Let's not forget that one of Jesus' original picks for his team ends up betraying him to death. I mean, we're talking about four fishermen, a hated tax collector, a member of a radical violent party, and like six guys that we know nothing else about, just about. These guys have no special qualifications at all. They're not wealthy. They have no social position. They have no special education. They're not trained theologians. They're not high-ranking religious leaders. There was not a preacher or an expert in the scriptures among the lot of them. And yet at the end of the day, it was this ragtag group through whom Jesus established the church that we're all a part of. Because they were part of multiplying a movement that took the Gospels to the end of the earth. They made disciples who made disciples who made disciples who made disciples. That is how the church grew like it did in those early decades. Not by addition, but by multiplication. And and I, I want you to hear this today. If they could do it, we can do it. If they could do it, we can do it too. And, and, and that's what I hope you hear today. I mean, if nothing else, just in order for us to actually move this conversation forward as a church, I need each one of you to join me in believing that that kind of multiplying movement is not just something that used to happen. It's not just something that happens somewhere else in the world. 
I need you to believe with me that the same God who has empowered multiplying gospel movements in the past and the same God who is empowering multiplying gospel movements in other parts of the world is the same God who can empower a multiplying movement right here, right now. You know, maybe as I'm saying all this, maybe you find that your mind is, you know, already rehearsing all the reasons why you can't be a disciple maker. And and if that's you, I'm just telling you right now, that's the voice of the enemy. (laughs) It's not the voice of the spirit. Don't listen to the lies. You know, one of my regrets about sort of the context we find ourselves in is, is that I think one of the downsides of the professionalization of ministry in our context, in which we have all these paid pastors and paid career missionaries, is that we've kind of, I think, bought into this lie that those are the people who make disciples. That's not the Bible's vision. The truth is we all have been power, empowered by God to make disciples. And we will not see a gospel movement in our context, in our day, until we start to embrace that identity, every one of us. Maybe as I'm talking about this today, you, you, just, you find yourself discouraged because you're, just, you're already feeling weary in life and it just sounds like another activity, another appointment, another program that I'm going to ask you to sign up for today before you leave. And if that's you, let me just help you out here. I'm not convinced that more church activity is the answer. I don't think it's more busyness that will make us as a church disciples who make disciples who make disciples. Frankly, I think maybe there's some simplification we need to move towards. Maybe there's some sort of like Western church detox we need to enter into so that we actually have the time and space and energy to engage in disciple making. I don't know that, or or I I know that we can't simply add disciple making to what we're already doing. It has to be the thing we're doing. And if we're going to do it well, we, we may have to leave some other church things behind so that we can engage in disciple-making in a life-giving way. And that's a conversation that I want to pick up with us again when we get to the new year. So uh, just wait for that. In the meantime, though, I want to suggest one thing that you could consider investing in in your life over the next couple of months. Being part of a disciple-making movement begins with us being disciples in the first place, right? Being part of a disciple-making movement begins with us first being disciples in the first place. Not just converts, not just weekend warriors, right? Jesus' disciples learned that there was a difference between hanging around Jesus and actually being with Jesus. The crowds, you know, they came out to see Jesus when he was in town and then they went back to normal life. For the disciples, Being with Jesus was their life. In in Mark 13, we read this little account. It says this, Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him. He appointed 12 that they might be with him. And that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. Folks, whatever whatever the disciples did, whatever those 12 did, it came out of a life of being with Jesus. Whatever training they got, it wasn't Thursday nights from 7 to 9 o'clock at the local hall. It came from watching and listening to and imitating Jesus. Whatever authority the disciples were given, it didn't come from inside themselves. It came out of their relationship with Jesus. As as disciples, we all come to the table with all our ignorance, all our weakness, 
all our frailty, and we simply need to learn to follow the pattern of Jesus in order for God to extend Jesus' ministry through us. Jesus is our model, and being with him means learning from his example. So can I, can I ask you to just consider something, one thing? In the next two months, as I said earlier, you know, we're going we're gonna to be we're going to be shifting to talk about uh, gender and sexuality and faith, and then we're going to be into the Advent season. That'll take us through the end of December. But then we're going to come back to this conversation. And again, if the first link in the chain of disciples who make disciples who make disciples is to be a disciple, then can we just, over the next couple months, just commit to starting where the 12 started? Watching Jesus. Learning from Jesus imitating Jesus. So so here's my ask. In the next two months, at whatever pace you want, would you consider reading through one of the Gospels? Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, you take your pick. If you want to do two of them, you can get bonus marks, as many marks as you want. Just, just, Just pick one of the Gospels and read through it. And as you read, just pay attention to what Jesus says. Pay attention to how Jesus acts. Pay attention to what Jesus does. Pay attention to where Jesus goes. And just keep asking yourself this question. What would it look like for me to be like what I see in Jesus in the story? What would it look like for me to do what I see Jesus doing? What would it look like for me to talk in the way I see Jesus talking? What would it look like for me to go to the places I see Jesus going? And then just in your regular life, just in your regular day-to-day coming and going, just pay attention to the opportunities you have to put into practice whatever it is that Jesus reveals to you about himself in the Gospels. Just just imitate him in your ongoing day-to-day life as best you can. Because more than any class, more than any strategy, more than any formula, that is where discipleship starts. So just start there. Because I'm telling you, there is no better example than Jesus. And there is no better trainer than the Holy Spirit. I'm going to invite you to just join me in a word of prayer. So we just reflect on these thoughts here. We read that passage from, from Mark, and I just, I just think Jesus' invitation to us today um, is to hear from him what those disciples heard from him. Come and be with me. Come and be with me. I think that's where it starts. So Jesus, might we all hear that invitation from you today. Jesus, thank you that that regardless of our lot in life, regardless of our strengths or weaknesses, regardless of our, our prominence or our, our obscurity, regardless of our own sense of success or failure, you love us. You invite us to be with you. And you give meaning and purpose to our lives. What, what a privilege we have to be the representatives of the living God in our world. Jesus, what an honor that you have chosen us. And what a relief, what a relief that you promise that you'll empower us for the mission to which we've been called. We don't have to do it on our own. We can't do it on our own. God, we want to be a church of disciples who make disciples, who make disciples, who make disciples. 
that we might see a gospel movement in our day and in our city. Thank you for the reminder today that throughout history, and even in our own day and other parts of the world, these kinds of movements happen through ordinary people doing extraordinary things because they're called and empowered by an extraordinary God. And so today, God, we come fully aware that we are those ordinary people. And we invite you to work in and through us for your glory, for your honor, for the building of your kingdom right here in our backyard. May we see and be a part of a gospel movement in our day. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. I invite you to stand with us one more time if you're able.
Pastor Matt, thanks for your message to us and for a challenge to be people who discipline ourselves to spend time with Jesus, to be with Jesus through the reading of the Gospels, to be on mission, following Jesus, falling in love with Jesus, making him known in all that we do. We hope you'll join us next week in person here at 10 a.m. or once again through the live stream option. I invite you now to receive the benediction. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power that is at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen. Go with God.